Hey, welcome back. This week's going to be a good week because this is usually the point where students start to feel like I can't do this. Uh, learning statistics is not for me. I'm going to fail this course and nothing is going to be okay in my life again. Well, you're rescued this week. This is a week that things turn around for students. I have a couple of tools that are going to help you out. I'm going to put you back on track. Uh, and just to illustrate that purpose, I've tied one of the most complex tie knots today. You may recognize it from the matrix. Why am I wearing this tie? Usually I just tie fancy knots with no purpose. Today there's a purpose. This particular knot's one of the hardest knots to learn. And the first time through, most people can't even get past like the third or fourth step. It's just confusing, it's complicated. And the point is that I like to learn a lot of different ways to tie a tie and what happens is sometimes you get stuck on that third step or the fourth step or the sixth step and you just can't get it. It doesn't click. So go back to the steps that you know. Lock in at those steps. If step one, wrap the long end around the skinny end. If that's easy, go back to that. You know that. Stay with it. It doesn't mean you don't know how to do that step. Step two, step three, step four. However far you can get, get to that step. Then there's a step that's, that's hanging you up. Maybe it's step five, maybe it's step six. But work on that step five. And if it doesn't work, go back to step four and work on step five again until you get it. And then go to step six and step seven. At some point, you're going to learn how to tie the tie. Then you can do it one more time. Then practice it three times, four times. After six, seven times, you can tie the thing without even thinking about it. You tie this really cool, super fancy knot. People always stop me and say, wow, that's the coolest knot. What is that thing? And I, we have a nice little conversation about it, nice conversation starter. So what does all this have to do with statistics? This is the week where I find that most of you are on that step six or seven where it's starting to feel overwhelming. You're starting to wonder if you're going to be able to learn it. Um, but you are going to tie a super awesome tie knot in statistics and you're going to impress your friends and it's going to be a conversation starter and all your dreams about statistics are going to come true. You just have to remember that there are certain things that you've been able to learn and master and go back to those and stay with those. If you're stuck on something, go back to the last step that you were really comfortable with and keep that. That's yours forever. No one can take it from you and then build on that. So go to that next step that's challenging you and remember that that doesn't take away anything else. It's just a step that's challenging you. You're locked in on the steps, that you, the things that you do know about statistics. And you're going to conquer that step six and seven and eight. And you're going to learn how to do this. I know that you will. So what I have here is a tool that I'm posting online for you. It's a gift from me to you. And students usually love this. And this usually helps a lot of them get over that hump, this, this peak of the learning curve. Uh, so this will be on Blackboard. Go to this and as you can see, look at this very first equation. It's pretty cool to impress a lot of people. There's some Greek mixed in there. You can be proud of yourself because you know this is X bar. You know this is the sample mean. And you know that in English it means to add up all the observation. All Xi means all the observations, all the Xs. Divide by N the number of observations. Um, so you've got the mean down pat. You know what the equation looks like, you know uh, what the symbol for it is, and you can talk about it in English and you can do it. I know this because I see that uh, there's not a single one of you that has a problem with this anymore on any of the assignments or anywhere. So this is step one, you've got this down. Uh, then we have mu, or what some people call mu, I think they're afraid of it sounding like a cow, uh, but mu. Uh, this is the population mean. So what we have is the same equation with large n instead of small n. And the vast majority of you know that this large n means all of the elements or all the people in the population. So we add up everybody and divide by that total number. And it's just like the mean except it's the, the mean for the entire population. And <clears throat> You've done standard deviation, which we have down here. This is standard deviation for a sample. This is standard deviation for a population. And you know that when we have the entire population, we can just use large n as the, the divisor. 
And hopefully you're catching on to the idea that we almost never know the entire number of the population. We almost never know every single element of the population. So we estimate that with n minus 1. So this is the one you're going to use most of the time. This is here as a courtesy to remind you where you've been. And you would use this if you know every single element in the population, if you have every single person in your population. But that's very rare in practice. So focus on this equation. Focus on the n minus 1 divisor for standard deviation. And this can either be sample standard deviation, um, but we also know that it can be used to estimate uh, the population standard deviation if we don't have all the, the elements. So um, it's n minus 1 is Bessel's correction. That's letting us estimate the population standard deviation. And most of you have this down pat. You're just experts on this. So these are all steps that you can lock in and you can say, these are things that I know. Uh, I'm learning statistics. I'm mastering this and I've had these successes. You also, most of you, are great with z-scores. You really get this idea that we have some x, we subtract from the mean, we find how far x is from the mean, and we divide by the standard deviation of the sample. That gives us a z-score. And that z-score relates to some area under a uh, bell curve. And we can talk about what that z-score means. We can say if it means that this observation is higher than 90% of observations, if it's only higher than 10%, uh, if it's higher than 50%, and most of you are just great at this. You can lock into this step two. This is something that you know. And now, uh, most of you are really picking up on this as well, that if we are now talking about not an observation, and this is key right here, not an observation in a sample, but we're talking about a sample mean in a theoretical distribution of all possible sample means of, of size n. If we take a sample of 100 and we took all possible samples, there would be a distribution with a lot of means, sample means close to the true population mean, and fewer out on the edges. And we know that we do that simply by adjusting this standard deviation that we used to know and love. We have to adjust it by dividing by square root of n, and that's just stats magic. It's just something that we do to adjust uh, when, we, when we don't know the all the elements in the population. We can divide uh, by the square root of n, and that will give us a good estimate. So this z becomes useful because just like we used to say 90% of people or this observation is bigger than 90% of, of observations that we would expect. Now we can take that and use it in this theoretical distribution of sample means. And we can say our sample mean, based on the z-score, is bigger than 90% of sample means that we would probably draw. And we've started talking about the way we can use that to compute a confidence interval. Uh, we Because if we know that 95% of sample means would fall between 13 and 15, then that's our confidence interval for the true mean. We're 95% sure that the true mean is between 13 and 15. So all of that is yours in most cases, and as far as I can see, that's the vast majority of the class. The vast majority of you have that sort of mastered, and you have at least a pretty good grasp of all those concepts. So. Uh, what's happening is that we're starting to get so much coming into our brains and storing up and it's it's going to become uh, rather difficult to keep all of that straight and that's why this point in the semester usually starts to panic some students uh, or why it gets a little bit tricky because you have so much uh, in there that you have to keep track of and to make this point uh, I've created a decision tree that I use in classes like this. And this shows you uh, everything that you've learned up to this point and things that you're going to learn this week. And this is going to be pretty much everything. We're going to do some ANOVA, we're going to do some two-way tables, we're going to do some regression analysis. But as far as the equations that you really, really have to know and be able to sort through, this is the vast majority of what you'll be expected to master in this class. So this will be on Blackboard as well, at least a link to this. 
You can print this off, you can save this somewhere, and really study this and go to this because what I find is that it's not any one of these things uh, that are too difficult. You can master every single thing that you see here. There's nothing too complex. None of the math is, is tricky uh, once you learn what it means, once you learn the English translation. So what happens is that uh, it's an issue of keeping all of this straight. When do I use what? So this decision tree, you can start off asking if you're interested in an observation in a sample, or if you're trying to use a sample mean, or we'll talk about a sample proportion, to make inferences about the population. If you're worried about a sample mean in the theoretical sampling distribution, that's this green. So you just follow that out. And if, are you interested in mean, in a mean, which is what we've mostly done, or proportion, and we're going to talk about proportions this week. And if it's a mean, then you come to the number. If it's, if you're just interested in one mean, then you use this equation if population standard deviation is known. You use this equation if it's not known, and it's about the same thing as you can see. Um, if you're interested in two means, that's, that's uh, where we're going to be. We've just started into that, but where we'll really be this week is that you may be interested in building a confidence interval, which we've done, and here's the equation for that. You just take the standard error, and some of you are still trying to use standard deviation, but if we're talking about a sample mean and how likely sample means are, then you're not in standard deviation land, you're in standard error land. So make sure you use the standard error. So you take the mean plus or minus the sample error times Whichever confidence interval you're interested in, you use that z-score, 1.645, 1.96, 2.58. You add it to the mean, that gives you your upper bound. You subtract it from the mean, that gives you your lower bound. And that's a confidence interval. And what will be new to you this week is the difference between two means. And that's a single thing. This, this sometimes looks scary to students, but that's a single thing. So if you have men's salaries of 40000 and women's salaries of 38,000. We're expressing it this way, but we're really interested in that 2,000. We're interested in the difference between men's salaries and women's salaries. We're interested in 2,000. And this is a new way to compute standard error. So starting this week, and this is absolute key, I want you to start thinking about, about standard deviations, plural. Standard errors, plural. Uh, we don't throw this at you right away because it would be a little heavy, but the same idea of standard deviation, the same idea of standard error, uh, we end up having to compute that because it's an estimate of the true population standard deviation. It's trying to estimate this theoretical distribution, stand, standard deviation in this theoretical distribution. We have to do some fancy math and some stats magic, and if you're not interested in calculus and philosophy that much, you can just memorize the equations, and that's the best route usually uh, in this class. So this equation right here is simply a new standard error. We use it for the difference between two means, um, and that's what the subsequent vid uh, video will talk about. This one's just to get you introduced to that, to introduce you to the equation sheet and the decision tree, and go to these frequently just spend a lot of time with them figuring out uh, how to use this, how to use the equation sheet. And they will, I promise, they will save you. If you can wrap your arms around this, there's nothing too mysterious in this class. There's nothing that will throw you off. So I wish you all the best in your study, and I have full confidence in you, and I'll see you in the next video.